after this manner, therefore, uh -huh. you pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our text is a familiar text. It is known as the Lord's Prayer. But in a real sense, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It is the disciples' prayer. It was the prayer, the model prayer, that Christ gave to his disciples when they had asked him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So John, no doubt, had disciples that were following Christ, following him. And then when Jesus came on the scene, by the river Jordan, John declared, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And from that point, the disciples stopped following John, and they started following Jesus. And when they asked John, was he upset, was he mad, because the disciples had stopped following him and was following Christ, John gave that glaring statement that he himself must decrease and Christ must increase. So therefore, it was important that the leadership be transferred because of the fact that John was coming off the scene and Christ was coming on the scene. Uh -huh. And when these disciples started following Jesus, they were reminded of the fact that John had taught his disciples to pray there were other disciples that had not been taught to pray. So they said, Jesus, teach us. We need to understand how to pray. And the Lord took that request and placed in our scripture the model prayer that we had before us this morning. And I'm going to deal with some of it, not all of it, because it's too much to deal with in one sermon, in one message. But we're going to, to look at the, the significance and the importance of what Jesus was trying to say to his disciples. For, for Jesus was that master teacher. No man spoke like that man. And when the words fell from his lips, there was no doubt that there was both wisdom and power and glory and majesty as he taught them along the roadside as he ministered to them and as he gave them insight and also inspiration to let them know that he was the light of the world. So Christ, as he gave parables, as he told simple stories about agrarian and agricultural issues, as he told stories about fishermen that went out to fish, Christ made sure that people could grasp what he was trying to say he wanted to make sure that people understood the truth. For he said in his word that ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So there is a premium, there is a benefit by knowing the truth. And Christ wanted to make sure that in the simplest form, they could understand the truth. It was Albert Einstein, that great scientist, who said that a genius would take complex things and make them simple. And a fool would take simple things and make them complex. Christ had the genius to take complex things and to reduce them in such a way that even children could understand what he has to say. So in this model prayer, we see the words that you pray in this manner, our Father. 
There is a fatherhood in theology. Now, all of us can recognize the fact that there is a father, a creator in this world. And many times we recite this prayer, we say our father. That is, that is a communion. That is an aggregate of a lot of folk. He didn't just say, say I father, but say our father. So we know that there is a fatherhood concept even in scripture. And when we come together, we pray. Collectively, we say our father. He is the father of creation. But also, those of us who have accepted Christ into our lives, he is also the father of our souls. And so we know him not only through creation, but we know him through salvation. Yes, he says, our father, collectively, we, that are together in fellowship, we that are on the same ship, in fellowship, and when the winds of life may blow against our ship, and when dark clouds may hover over us, and the sun seems like it refuses to shine, we know that as long as Christ is on our ship, and we are fellow shipping together, we can declare in clarion terms, our Father, our Father who is in heaven. God is transient. God is above us. God is in heavenly places. Our Father who is in heaven. He is so majestic that he can be in heaven, but also he can walk by our side every day here on earth. He's the type of God that is with us always, even though he is stationed spiritually in heaven. Through his power, he has the capacity, he has the way to be with us every step of our way. Our Father, who is in heaven, who is hallowed, who is holy, who is in heaven. Holy be your name, our Father, who is holy. Holy being separated. If something is holy, it is separate from something that is unholy. So therefore, God is a God that is holy. And his holiness was exhibited when he took Brother Moses up on the mountain of Sinai. And as Brother Moses was up there and he saw a burning bush. And as God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, God said to Moses, take the shoes from off your feet for the ground that you are standing on. Yes, sir is holy ground. Because wherever God is, that's where holiness is. That God is separated and set apart from his creation, but yet, praise be to God, he can be even with his creation, with us. Your kingdom come. Christ came to present the kingdom. The world was dark, in the first century, there was economic exploitation, there was political corruption, there was social degradation. It was a darkened world, and Jesus came into this world in order to shed some light. And his first message was repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, to change your mind as it relates to God and even change your mind as it relates to the theology of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus came to present a new kingdom, a new gospel. And reminded of the words that he said in Luke chapter 4. He said, Brother Rick, the spirit of the God, the spirit of the Lord is upon me uh -huh. because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal broken hearts, to preach deliverance to those that are captive, to recovering of sight to those that are blind, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And as Christ presented the kingdom. There were those who accepted him, Sister Esther, but there were those also who rejected him. 
For we remind you in John when he said, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to they gave he power to become sons and daughters of God. Christ came down 42 generations, walked down the stairways of the stars to present the kingdom unto us that we may have a right to the tree of life. So he said, let my kingdom come, let my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And even as believers, I charge as I challenge is to pray and to make sure that God's will is done. First of all, God's will should be done in our lives. Because God has a will for every one of our lives. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has a spiritual prescription for each one of our lives. And our prayer should be, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. And if God's will is done in our individual lives, church, then God's will will be done in this world. But first we have to find out what God are you asking me to do? What is your will for my life? Verse 11 is the verse that I want to center in on these next 15 minutes or so. Verse 11 is a, an amazing verse because it says so much to us and so few words. This prayer reminds us that prayer is not just an accumulation of words. It's not how many words you can say, but it's the attitude, the attitude of your heart. You can say a thousand words and mean none of them. But as Brother Peter, who was walking on the water, and as he saw the wind and the waves, and he was about to sink, his simple prayer was, Lord, save me. It doesn't have to be long and drawn out, but it should be a simple, sincere utterance of the heart. Prayer is an attitude. Prayer is something that we do, that we feel, something that we want to communicate with God. And many times we go to God not with an attitude, many times of, Lord, make me, but sometimes we go with an attitude of give me. And God is not some spiritual Santa Claus. God is not some spiritual bellhop that he can pick our bags up and put them down when he wants to. But God is a God that we can go to with an attitude of praise, with an attitude of thankfulness. You know, when I drive, I, I, I watch people. I also watch the river, but I watch people also. But, but when I drive, I, I always notice when I let somebody into the road or they're at a corner or something, I may pause and stop by telling them to go ahead or if, if I do something nice on the road, I always watch to see whether or not they're going to say thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they wave their hand and right. say thank you. Watch anybody who does not have the right attitude of thankfulness and of, of gratitude. But, but God is a God that when we go to him with the right attitude, it should be one, first of all, of thankfulness. Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, thank you for allowing the blood to pulsate warmly throughout my veins. Thank you for my mental capacity to understand things. Thank you for the joy in my spirit, for the peace in my heart. Thank you for the material thing that you have given me in life. I may not have all that I want, but praise be to God, I have all that I need. We should be thankful to God for what he has done for us. And the more you thank God for, the more he will give you to thank him for. An attitude, not accumulation of words, but an attitude is how we communicate with our Father who is in heaven. And when the going gets tough, and when the going gets rough, and it will be that way in life, prayer gives us that inner vitality. 
that vigor, gives us that spiritual strength to go on in spite of. God has a way of empowering us when we are willing to sincerely have a good attitude relating to prayer. Give us, us, this day, our daily bread. That verse reminds us to stay within that daily moment, to stay present. We live one day at a time. Give us this day. Because in a real sense, this is the only day that we have. Amen. In a real sense, this is the only time that we have. Amen. In a real sense, many times we allow ourselves, like Jesus, to be crucified between two thieves. Regrets for yesterday and fear of tomorrow. Two thieves that we can do nothing about. What happened yesterday is gone and dead, is dead and has died in the ash heap of eternity. And what will happen tomorrow, none of us had the monopoly on it. But Christ was saying in this text, give us this day, today, for the real sense, that's all we have. God may call us into eternity tonight. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. It behooves us this day, right now, to recognize the fact that this is the only time that we have. The only moment, the only substance, the only real thing that we have right now. Not only does this verse remind us of staying in the moment, it reminds us that God is the greatest giver of all. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread, our substance, our nourishment. What we stand in, I remember, I remember Brother Ron, years ago, he used to call it great money, amen? I don't want to call it now, but yeah. it, uh, it may be big or something now, I don't know what it is, but, but, we, but we, used to, we used to call it bread money. So whatever we were saying, whatever you need in life, whatever bread you need in life, whether you need a job, whether you need nourishment physically, whether you need stability emotionally, no matter if you need health physically, whatever you need in life, that nourishment, that will satisfy you. That's what the text is saying. Give us this substance. Whatever you need to make it through this thing we call life. Christ is saying we should ask our Father for it. For it is our Father's will that we should receive those things. That's why the text, the Bible says, ask and it shall be given. Seek, and he shall find, knock, and the door shall be opened. For he that asketh, receiveth. For he that seeketh, findeth. For he that knocketh, the door shall be opened. It reminds us that God is the greatest giver. And I like that verse by James Cleveland, Brother Rick. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to sing it, but I want you to listen. He said his... His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries, known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. God is the greatest giver of all. Thirdly and lastly, as I bring this message to a close, this text reminds us that ultimately Jesus is the bread of life. Yes, sir. 
For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And Jesus is that word, that logos, that language of eternity that came down and broke into humanity that we may have a right to the tree of life. Give us Father in heaven. Give us Savior. Give us this day our daily bread and let us remain looking into the hills with cometh our help. For our help cometh from the Lord that made heaven and made earth. And that God is a God that giveth out. He had given the best that he had. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave the best that he had that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave the best that he had that we may have a right to the tree of life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those, our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as we continue this month preaching, we will continue that great model prayer. But this day, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we stand together. Jesus, forgive us of our debts. My last point is this. We all owe a debt. We all owe God for whatever we have. And to satisfy that debt, He don't want our money. He don't want what's in our bank account. But he wants a heart. The question was asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer came back, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, as we're standing, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, we're going to extend the invitation to you. There's no science to it. There's no magic to it. It is simply recognizing the fact that we owe a debt that we could not pay. And Jesus died on the cross and paid a debt that he did not owe. And that he loved us so much that he gave his life that we may have a right to the tree of life. And all we have to do in our own way recognize the fact that in this world in which we live we need a savior. In this world in which we live we need an anchor. And as the turbulent waves will blow in our lives we know that our soul has been anchored in the Lord have not yet accepted Christ into your life. All heads bowed, all eyes closed as we're standing, as we're watching by even way of Facebook, by those that are watching by way of television. If you have not yet accepted Christ in your life, now could be your time. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had made a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. In your own way, accept him into your heart. And he will no wise cast you out. Do it to the trip over today. We have one today. Give the preacher your hand. Give the Lord your heart. Christ said, I stand with 10,000 blessings in my hand to satisfy the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my, my yoke is easy and my burdens, they are light. The Spirit says, come.
bride says, Come. Whosoever is willing, let him come to drink of the water of life freely. Father in heaven, we're thankful and grateful that you still sit high and you still look low. That everything we stand in need of, you have the power to deliver. Now bless those under the sound of my voice. Bless those that are watching. Bless those that are listening. And do a work in their life according to your will, according to your ways, and according to your word. In the matchless name of Jesus, who is the Christ, our Lord, we pray. The church said, Amen.